Greetings. In some traditions, the fifth Sunday in Lent is referred to as Utica Sunday, named after the first word of the introit for the day, Utica Mei Deus, or Judge Me God. In many Christian traditions, however, the fifth Sunday is called Passion Sunday, as it is the Sunday that marks the distinction between the beginning of Lent and the beginning of Passion Tide. Today we move more intentionally away from our personal experience of Lent and into the story of Christ and his death on the cross. Utica Mei Deus contains verses that reflect on Psalm 43. Hear the words of the psalm and let the sound of the antiphone transport you to the hours and days leading up to Jesus' eventual capture. Vindicate me, my God, and plead my cause against an unfaithful nation. Rescue me from those who are deceitful and wicked. You are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Send me your light and your faithful care. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. The author of the 43rd Psalm isn't Jesus, but What can we find relatable in the psalmist's word about the state of mind of Jesus as he spent his last days knowing his death was imminent? Are you weary? Are you heavy laden? Come to the Lord today in worship and prayer, knowing he has experienced the fullness of your grief and sorrow and is on the journey with you even unto death. Now read along with me the end of the introit for Passion Sunday as a prayer in which to enter our worship. Send forth thy light and thy truth. They have conducted me and brought me unto thy holy hill and into thy tabernacles. Amen.
friends. We're doing another video from uh, Sharon Kim. This one's Amazing Grace with a bit of a uh, upbeat tempo. None of us know the motions, but we're going for it. So follow me and I'm going to follow her. Here we go. Let us pray. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Lord, in this image of the final days, it is an image that is diverse. Surrounding your throne are people from every tribe and nation, every color. We know that you are a God who loves all of your children and that you are grieved at the events of this week here in our nation. And so, Lord, we want to echo your heart. We, your people, want to take this moment to grieve with you and to grieve with our brothers and sisters around the United States for the events of this week. Lord, we grieve these hateful acts of violence targeting communities of color, not only in Atlanta, but right here in Seattle. We pray for our brothers and sisters at Emerald City Bible Fellowship who experienced gun violence in their own sanctuary this week. We grieve for those who have lost loved ones due to senseless attacks. We grieve the skyrocketing number of incidents of violence against Asian Americans in our nation, including Tuesday's murder of eight people in Atlanta, six of whom were Asian women. We grieve the loss of human beings that were made in the image of God and loved by him. 
we grieve the constant fear of violence that Asians and African Americans face in our nation, mirrored by the experiences of other marginalized people throughout our country's history. We pray for Asian American and African American clergy that are navigating these spaces of self-care, exhaustion, and care for others, all in the midst of a pandemic. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would convict and empower us, not just to pray and lament, but to stand and work for justice, peace, and reconciliation. Take a moment now, either in the chat or out loud at home, to lift up the people, the organizations, the communities that you know who are suffering as a result of the racism in our nation and our systems. And now let us join together in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, and good evening to Sanctuary, and good morning, Mill Creek. The peace of God be with all of you this morning. I asked our staff if I could preach on this passage of scripture because I love it, but I um, am actually not a very gifted preacher. I have no training in the teaching of the word. I am, however, a musician and an artist, and I enjoy the challenge of illuminating scripture through creative liturgy. So this week, I asked two friends to join me in sharing this gospel story with you. Sarah Lewis Osink is, in fact, a gifted teacher of the word, and you will hear a discussion between the two of us and a beautiful piece of creative writing by Elise Stevens. Not your normal Sunday sermon, but hopefully you find something new in this illumination of scripture. Let's begin this morning by hearing the word. This is Mark 14, 1 through 11. Now the Passover and festival of unleavened bread were two days away, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him covertly and kill him. For they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise there will be a riot of the people. While he was in Bethany, at the home of Simon the leper, he was reclining at the table, and a woman came in with an alabaster vial of very expensive perfume of pure nard. She broke the vial and poured the perfume over his head. But there were some indignantly remarking to one another, Why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume could have been sold for over 300 denarii, and the money had been given to the poor. And they were scolding her. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a good deed for me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good to them. But you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand before the burial. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the entire world, what this woman has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. They were delighted when they heard this and promised to give him money, and he began seeking how to betray him at an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
So one of the most beautiful and frustrating things about reading scripture is realizing that we're reading it with other people's eyes. There are so many well-intentioned people who want to say that we can read the Bible with complete objectivity. And this kind of belief leads to that bumper sticker that we can see on, on cars around. The Bible says it, I believe it, the end. But we know that when we engage with scripture, we're reading it through the lens of hundreds of thousands of the eyes that have read it before us. We're reading it through our parents' eyes and through our pastor's eyes and through the eyes of our current culture. And that culture is colored by the cultures who studied the words in these books in the centuries before us. Having lots of different perspectives is not a problem that needs to be solved, right? Uh, and it doesn't diminish the work of the Holy Spirit. The word is living and our recognition of the complexity and connectedness to others allows us to find ourselves in the story and see how God has worked and continues to work through his people. Yeah, and one of the lenses, like you mentioned, is the author of Mark, right? This book that we're reading. And the author of the Gospel of Mark has his own perspective. And that's just one beneficial voice in helping us understand the person and deity of Jesus. Each gospel writer is its own little bubble of Jesus tinted glasses. What was important to them? What were they um, getting in the details when they did the research and, and talked with people um, to learn more about the life and ministry and death and resurrection of Jesus? The four perspectives of the gospel writers, plus the people they got those perspectives from, help us at least get a glimpse of who Jesus is. And given that he's, you know, God, it's not like we're ever going to have a perfect picture. But scripture and these gospels give us a glimpse. Who was he? How did he live? How did he love? And how might we love like he did? And I think this passage particularly that we just read is interesting because there's so many debates within it. Religious leaders, theologians have spent so much time trying to paint their evidence into the story. So things like who was the woman specifically? Was she Mary Magdalene? Was she Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus? Was she another unknown sinner woman like Luke refers to her? Was she just a random woman who came into the story like a shadow? We just don't know. In addition to these uh, debates about who the woman is, there's a debate about when the event took place and where. Um, from verses one and two in Mark, we know that it's important to his storytelling of the story that the event took place right before the Passover, two days before the Passover, um, lending credence to the prophecies about the Passover lamb, the death of the Passover lamb. But some gospels have it six days before, Mark has it too, and Luke has it in an entirely different time and setting, almost to the point where people assume that it's a completely different anointing, or maybe not an, even an anointing at all. Yeah, so there's debates about who the woman is, when it happened, but that even has sparked debate about the actions of the woman. Uh, was it prophetic? Um, the way that she anointed him uh, for burial, as Jesus indicates in the Mark passage that we read? Or was it just an action driven by compulsion to lavish Jesus with love? Um, for some of the gospel writers, maybe it was simply a plot device by that author um, borrowing from a different story in order to illustrate to those who witnessed Jesus's ministry, because even the disciples missed the point at every turn and using this story as another part of, are you getting it yet? Yeah, in verse 9, Jesus insists that at every reading or recitation of the gospel, what this woman has done will be spoken of, that this story will be told. But one of the crazy things about this passage and the part that sparks like the inner debate within me is that this woman doesn't even have a name in this story. Um, there's so much confusion about who she is, even though Jesus says, you will tell the story of this woman. We don't know who she is. To me, that sparks this um, internal debate about patriarchy. It gets my kind of feminist tackles up. Um, it's so frustrating that this person that Jesus specifically called out to be remembered uh, has been watered down and washed away. Her identity has been stripped away. Her motivation has been stripped away. And that in a lot of ways, 
she's painted as this sinner woman, but that internal debate sparks in me this memory of the first book of the Bible that I was ever taught um, in a Bible study that I went to um, when I first came to know the Lord in um, 2005. Uh, our first book that we studied was Revelation, which is kind of ridiculous <laughs> as a first book to study, but it was actually a really, it set a really good standard for me because um, the leader of this Bible study helped me understand that despite the fact that there's all this allegory and imagery and confusion and tons of debate over what Revelation means or um, what John was trying to communicate, the author continues to steer us back to this one important fact that Jesus is worthy of worship. And it reminds me that as I get caught up in the reading of this passage and a lot of passages, when I, a lot, most of the Bible, that when I get caught up in thinking about um, my own internal debate or society's debate that I often miss the point. And if I I'm caught up in my own deeply held biases, I'm most likely missing the point. Um, like what, I'm missing what Jesus is trying to communicate. Yeah, I like that you bring that up because it, I feel like this story has that particularly as well. And when we get caught there, it's like, I think of it, I think of it like when, um, if I were to have to Google, how do I love Jonathan? Well, I'm clearly not doing it well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need some help. <laughs> so if we get caught on those questions, then, then that's, we're missing the point entirely. We're, we're not at Jesus. We're not focused on Jesus and what's happening with Jesus in the story. We're caught on our own questions or the specifics. And this is one of those stories. I feel like there's lots of examples of this in the Bible. And I mean, maybe you could say the whole thing, but I've read a lot of the Bible. I wouldn't want to experience all of it, but this story in particular feels like it's one that needs to be experienced. The narrative moment here for Mark is so poignant in the first two verses that we read the religious leaders are debating whether or not they're going to have Jesus killed. Um, and they say, oh, not right now. It's fine. And then in the last two verses, verses 10 and 11, Judas decides to start betraying his leader, his friend, his, his rabbi, right? Um, and so this but, is just a, a significant moment in the middle, that, that, those middle passages. Yeah, in the middle of all of that chaos and noise and distraction is this woman with her own story. And it, it feels significant that in the middle of these stories of angry men is a woman with a jar of perfume. It, a woman in the middle of a society, society that shuns women, that devalues their gifts, that doesn't even remember their names is this woman. And if you believe Jesus, which I do, and Sarah does, her story is important. So we get the opportunity now to experience the story for a moment. We're going to hear from this woman in this creative space. We're going to hear her perspective uh, creatively told. And I think through this, as you listen, consider the weight of her actions. Consider the worry of her actions and the, the wonder and the worship that her actions bring to. Please join me in an imaginative journey inspired by the events of Mark 14, Matthew 26, and John 12. My heart pounded in my throat, but something told me it was now or never. I'd hoped to do this in a less public moment. Jesus already knew that I loved him. I didn't need to show off. Besides, the other guests might think I was trying to make them look bad, to boast that my love was better than theirs. My hands were sweaty. 
they slipped on the alabaster jar. It was the most precious thing I owned, and I knew in a way that didn't want logic or economics or math that it was supposed to be for Jesus, and that if I didn't bring it to him tonight, I would be missing my chance. So I crept into the room where they were eating, and they looked at me like I had just said something awfully rude or embarrassing. I almost dropped the jar right there. But then I saw the different way that Jesus was looking at me, and all my courage returned. No, not courage. That sounds too much like the stuff you need for war or violence. His eyes gave me peace and welcome. His smile blessed me and gave me permission to stay. My eyes clouded with tears and I knew I'd have to work fast or I would start sobbing. I broke the flask and the scent of nard swelled to fill the whole room. It enclosed me and Jesus like a curtain, and for a moment I could imagine I was there with him with no one gawking at me as I honored him in the way I knew he deserved. I let the oil spill onto his hair. I love you. I let it run over his feet. I love you. There was no cloth to mop up the excess, so I loosened my hair and used it to wipe his feet. Please, please understand how much I love you. All the while, Jesus smiled at me. I really think he understood. He didn't wait for me to give him a speech or explanation. I couldn't have done it. Then that beautiful curtain of nard perfume fell away, torn by voices that were shaming and scolding me. I had wasted a small fortune. There were better uses for the worth of that gift. I was a fool. Then my tears really did spill over, but they were bitter now. I looked at the ground and waited for Jesus to agree with the rest of them. Some people look at an object and they immediately see how much it's worth. And how can I not do the same thing? I've been taught my whole life to break everything down into its worth, to judge some things as less and some as more deserving of time or resources. But when Jesus speaks, I hear eternity stirring in a human mouth. I see boundless love glowing behind kind human eyes. I smell both divine wisdom and salty sweat on his skin. He was of a worth that no one could measure in gold or coin. If then he was of unfathomable worth, then I could only reach back to him with as much as my own means allowed in that moment, not to squander, but to try to love him with a token of how he'd first loved me. Not to meet him gesture for equal gesture. I could never do that. But his love was enough for the both of us. And I wanted him to know. I understood. Or at least that I was beginning to understand. He honors even the most faltering beginnings. So, I took my alabaster jar. I poured into it my love and wonder, my sense of fleeting precious time and my fear of missing my chance to show him. And I stepped into that room and did what my heart said had to be done. I honored my Lord with all the riches I could hold.
One of the things readers are prone to do when they're reading scripture, um, especially these anecdotal events in scripture is put ourselves into the narrative, put ourselves into the story, um, become a player in the story. This is why reading scripture can be so subjective. Depending on who you embody, you can find there's revelation in all different angles. Sarah, when you hear this story about the woman anointing Jesus at Bethany, whose shoes are you wearing? Um, I will be more vulnerable than I prefer to be. Um, <laughs> because when I read this story, I find myself sympathetic to the people who questioned the cost of the jar and uh, felt frustrated at the woman for um, not giving it away to the poor. I am Judgy McJudgerson <laughs> and I judge people related to how they spend their money. I judge myself related to how I spend my money. And as much as I hate to admit it, I would be a person saying, couldn't th this have been used better? Um, which really means that I'm saying that the money should have been used the way I wanted it to be used, which is to say efficiently, maybe even collectively for the better of betterment of everyone. And, and I, what I really mean is that it should be less lavish, less reckless. Mm -hmm. And part of that certainly is my own personality, um, but it's also informed by my long participation with the church. How does the church spend its money? Who does it benefit? Are the, ben the beneficiaries of that money going to do with it what I think they should do? what we as a, as a body think they ought to do. Those would, would be the questions that I would be asking where I'd be in the first century. And those are certainly the questions I have to battle against with myself now in the 21st century. So Maggie, what about you? Whose shoes do you wear? I'm going to be more vulnerable than I would prefer to be. <laughs> moment. Oh, that there's a three part answer to that question. I think for me, uh, I, I'm reminded, I think I would be, I would be judgmental, but my judgment would um, come down to whether or not this person was worthy of worshiping, whether or not they belonged there, um, whether or not their worship was authentic. For a long time before I was a worship leader, I would sit at the back of churches, especially big churches, and um, because I felt like I liked to see the whole room. But often I would find myself watching people raise their hands in worship and, and thinking to myself, are they really like feeling the Holy Spirit or are they just following along? Are they doing what they think they should be doing? And I would get so caught up in that judgment process that I would miss the worship altogether, which is sort of the point I think <laughs> that we're trying to make here is I got, I would get caught up. And I think, I think I would be someone who was worried that that person, that the woman was not worshiping authentically. Um, I think I would, if I were to answer honestly, second part, I think if I were to answer honestly who I want to be, I want to be the woman. I want to be someone who's so um, blinded to everything else but Jesus that that I can't help but just like like John fall on my face uh, as if I'm dead because I just I can't not love Jesus. Um, I'm so moved by uh, the piece of work that Elise put together um, because it really shows that there's a possible way to do that, to love like that. Um, I think in reality, I a lot of us have asked that question. Um, I can only imagine if we were face to face with Jesus, how would 
how would we respond or what would we do? Would we bow or kneel or fall on our face or would we, um, or would we just, uh, I don't know, start singing his praise or dance? Um, I, I think a lot of us, I know I would, would, would really want to ask questions. Um, things like why cancer or why COVID or why hate crime? Um, why is there, why is there anger and hatred in the world? Um, I would love to think though, that he would answer me. I wonder if he wouldn't answer me in the same way that he does the disciple who asks why, why are you wasting this money? Um, I, I would assume that he would answer me in a similar way. Uh, something like, because I'm not going to be here forever. Love me now. Like, love me as I'm in front of you. Thanks for being honest about that. You too. <laughs> I certainly would be asking those questions too. I'm asking those questions now, right? Um, and, and, and I get frustrated by scripture that in every gospel account, Jesus, as much as I love it, it irritates me that he is against conforming to those boxed questions of theology. Right. Um, and in the first century, in the 21st century, we want our answers to perfectly valid questions, right? Our, our questions aren't invalid. And Jesus is redirecting um, us. He was redirecting um, the, the questioners in this story back to something else. And that something else is, I have a better way. And his better way is the way of reckless love, which is to love inefficiently, to love without agenda and to love individuals and communities that religious institutions, that religion that we all shun and discard. And that is the way of Jesus. And it is the hardest way, <laughs> even when we have really valid questions to get turned back to, you're focused on the wrong thing, focus on me. And how do we do that? I mean, how do we do what Jesus has asked of us and how do we, how do we respond? Like the woman responds, like, how do we get there? How, when, when those questions start to arise and when, um, doctrine starts to overtake our perception of what love looks like when, um, institutions or structures or systems begin to be the, the groundwork that we're laying in order to show love, how do we get to that place where we don't see that, where that's all noise that we can cancel out? I think that's the hardest question, right? How do we do that? <laughs> um, but luckily scripture speaks to scripture and Jesus in that asking us to find a better way leads us to something he said in John 15. Um, this is verses 12 through 17. Jesus says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay one's life down for one's friends. Just quite foolish in my Sarah aside. You're my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything that I've learned from my father I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And fruit takes a long time, not an efficient way to, to love. <laughs> and so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. So Jesus's better way, I think is, is really summed up here really well, but it's summed up in a way that feels really antithetical to the way we're created, right? To, to love 
lavishly and recklessly. And I was really grateful for summer sermon last week. Um, she reminded us that Jesus wants to break systems of oppression, right? In looking at um, the widow's might, um, but but that it's not just systems of oppression that exist in institutions, it's the systems of oppression that get set up in our hearts. And to know Christ and to know his will, we have to see beyond the noise, we have to see beneath the noise that crowds out the experience of knowing Jesus. Um, that pushes us away from the encounters with Christ that we are called into. That's that noise, that distraction, that debate, that internal dissonance can sound like exclusion. Yeah. Like she doesn't belong here or like fear. What if the crowds riot or like, <clears throat> self-righteousness well oh, that's a tough one for me but uh, yes and that's what's valuable and what should be the money we spend should be something i've agreed to absolutely or passivity yeah yeah i won't say anything but i'm gonna sit by silently and judge but we know that silence is is violence yeah uh Sarah, we talked about this next thing that we're going to talk about, and we debated whether or not we were going to mention it. Um, this week is particularly um, important to this conversation, um, and we were we were afraid to speak of the events of this week. We were afraid, like the religious leaders at the beginning of the passage that we read, we were afraid of speaking about the shootings in Atlanta and the hate crimes that were perpetrated in Seattle. Um, we were afraid because we thought that this creative liturgy that we're putting together, this conversation that we're having might turn to lean a little too political. We were afraid it would cause division in our community or draw away from the main thing. We were afraid that the conversation might turn to race or sex or violence against women, and that's uncomfortable. But that's kind of the whole point, isn't it? To stop debating, get the noise out of our head, all the voices that would tell us to fear the things that are on the pathway to love and to just love one another recklessly. Yeah. And, and in responding and honoring what's happened and collectively grieving, this is a way to love our Asian, Asian American Pacific Islander community, both here in Seattle, in the US and around the world. Every victim of these horrible acts of domestic terrorism is a person, a person with a story with specific motivations and a life and someone who's loved by God. And the stories get framed through whatever the lens the storyteller the storyteller chooses so there's already these rumors circulating and spinning that paint the picture that these victims particularly in atlanta deserved their untimely death because of the work that they had and so if the vent if the lens that we have is um simply white supremacy the majority asian victims were subhuman if our lens is patriarchal purity culture, then the majority women victims were a stumbling block, a vehicle for lust because of their work. And if the lens is through one that centers white male murderers, we're missing the opportunity to love, to love one another, to love the families of these um, people who lost their lives to, to love our community that's grieving and hurting. Um, even if we're not a part of that Asian, Asian American Pacific Islander community specifically, we are all in this world together and can grieve together. And so we have the opportunity to love one another through knowing their stories, 
and caring about um, what happened to them and how their lives have made an impact in the world and will continue to make an impact and how we can choose to respond. And to, to dip back into the first century and, and relate it to the 21st century, we just need to consider all the stories that we're being told through any lens, but the woman's in this passage of scripture. I think the questions were asked, was she a sinful woman? And I think that we can all agree that we're all sinful, but there is a societal brushstroke that is um, cast over the word sinful in this context to mean sexual. She was a sexual woman. She was a prostitute. Painting a story on this woman that Jesus was not speaking to. He did not speak to prostitution to this woman. Um, another way of looking at it, if you're looking through the lens of one of the other onlookers was uh, she was emotional or irrational um, and that breaking this vial of expensive perfume was irresponsible. That's another painting of this character when Jesus saw who she was, when Jesus saw what she was doing and her intent and her motivation. And even after rebuking the onlookers, he knew who she was. The woman had an encounter with the living God. That's a person I wanna to listen to and I wanna know because I wanna have encounters with the living God. And if she does it, I wanna know what she's doing. The way to love Jesus with recklessness is to know him, listen to him, abide in him, know his commands. What, what happened this week, not only in Atlanta, but in our own city is a sign that Jesus' messages have been too watered down, too debated, too distorted and perverted and surrounded by too much noise. And, and I like when you said, Maggie, that you know, to love like Jesus loved, to love in the way that the woman loved Jesus and to love Jesus in response is to hear a story and to, to get to know a person. That takes time. And we want to be efficient with our time. We want to be efficient with our actions. We want things to move at the pace we want them to move. And, and Jesus is constantly calling us back to love with abandon love with recklessness, love without an agenda. And in doing that, it doesn't look the same for all of us. We all are, are, are coming to Jesus in these different ways. And Jesus is saying, here's how I'm putting people in front of you. This is how I want you to love them. But we have to listen to that. And in order to do that, in order to love up the person standing in front of us, we have to put on those noise canceling headphones of what our culture tells us, of what our um, families tell us, of what our own internal uh, oppressive structures or personalities tell us about how we, the right way to love someone is and to find the better pathway to love like Jesus, um, to love without condition. And, and in doing that, we can be reminded that the only judge of, of worthiness is Jesus. And he's not judging us anyway. And he, and he wants nothing more than for us to love one another. And that is going to take all of us doing that together for us to find that better pathway towards him.